the medical practices of the Lewis and Clark expedition coming to the interpreting center. It bleed, bluster, and purge medicine on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Is the title of the fascinating program on its way to the interpreting center. Uh, medicine was practiced on the Lewis and Clark expedition in the early 1800s. Medicine was still very primitive by the 21st century standards during the Lewis and Clark expedition. But Meriwether Lewis, with only three weeks of formal medical training, some help from William Clark, an intuitive grasp of natural medicines, managed to bring a large crew of people through a two and a half year wilderness trek with only one fatality. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jeff LaRock, our special presenter of tonight's program. Jeff became his interpretive career at Fort Scott National Heritage Site in Kansas after a park ranger internship at Yorktown Battlefield and historical historical site in Kansas after a park ranger internship at Yorktown Battlefield and seasonal tours at Biscayne and Everglade National Park. Next, he transferred to the Calamante Battlefield of the Jeanette Lafayette National Historic Park in Louisiana, where he moved for just over, served for just over nine years. His next assignment took him to the Lava Bed National Monument in Northern California where he served as the lead interpreter park ranger for nearly five years. In March of 2003, Jeff arrived at his current assignment in the Lewis and Clark National Trail Interpreting Center in Great Falls, Montana. Since his arrival, he served in a variety of capacities culminating in his current position as the interim director of the Lewis and Clark Interpreting Center. Jeff is a key component in bringing quality, education, and awareness to the public on the core of discovery through a variety of regular and special interpretive programs such as you will enjoy tonight. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Lerock. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome everybody. Uh, like Claire said, uh, my name is Jeff Lerock and for good or ill, I am the uh, acting center manager at this point. <laughs> Uh, normally, supervisory interpreter for the center position I have uh, yeah, held since 2003. And will hold probably for another year and a half until I retire. So, anyway, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Tonight, I'd like to speak to you a little bit about medicine on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Now, this is a subject that I've well, medicine in general in the early 19, uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries has been something I've been studying alone for most of my career. Uh, it's a fascinating subject, but it does have a tendency to get caught up in uh, speaking way too much to the blood, guts, and gore, <laughs> and not much about everything else. So we'll try to remedy that a little bit this evening. As you point out, there is uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition lasted nearly two and a half years. During that time, it covered more than 8,000 miles, mostly through unmapped wilderness terrain. And at one time or another, more than 50 different people took part in at least a portion of this trip. And out of that total, how many men did Lewis lose? One. One. Sergeant Charles Floyd died in August of 1804, not far from where Sioux City, Iowa is today. Most of the doctors who have studied records of the expedition believe that Sergeant Floyd died due to complications from a ruptured appendix, which would have killed him pretty much anywhere in the country. Appendicitis was a fatal condition well into the 20th century. That is a rather impressive record of doctoring, especially when you consider there's no doctor <coughs> with the core of discovery. Lewis is the closest thing you have to one with a little bit of help from Clark, and that's not an unusual situation. 
If you had lived in the United States in the year 1805 and you got sick or injured, you would have pretty much been on your own. I mean, chances are there would have been a doctor in the town closest to your farm. And if you live like most Americans do in 1805, you live on a farm near a small town. But the doctor in town probably didn't go to medical school. Less than one doctor in ten got his formal training that way. The common way to become a doctor was to apprentice with a doctor who was in practice already and learn on the job. Sometimes for as little as two years before setting up your own practice. And doctors who learned by doing were usually considered more effective than the ones who went to school for it. Ameriwether Lewis did not begin his Western sojourn completely unprepared in medical matters. His mother, Lucy Meriwether Marks, was well known as an herb crafter. That is, she knew a lot about medicinal plants and herbs and appears to have passed a lot of that knowledge down to Meriwether. But Lewis also had some formal medical training. Three weeks, to be precise. But studying with one of the best known physicians in the country, Dr. Benjamin Rush. See, in the early part of 1803, President Jefferson had sent Lewis to the Philadelphia area to go through a series of crash study courses to pick up extra skills the president felt would be useful for uh, Lewis to acquire before heading west. Dr. Rush is one of the men that Lewis studied with. Now, Rush was very well known in the country at the time. Benjamin Rush was a member of the Continental Congress. He is one of the 55 signers of the Declaration of Independence. <coughs> he was briefly Surgeon General of the Continental Army. Later in life, he founded one of the first medical colleges in the United States, was very active in the abolition movement, and during his lifetime was probably the most influential medical theorist in the United States. Now, Dr. Rush held that uh, physicians had a moral obligation to intervene with their patients to heal their sickness or cure their cure their sickness or heal their injury. An attitude they tend to refer to today as the heroic school of medicine. Benjamin Rush believed that human health was very much similar to the scales on a, or the balance pans on a scale. As long as the stimulative forces acting on your body were in balance, you were healthy. If they got out of balance, if your body was overstimulated or understimulated, you got sick. The doctor's job was to restore the balance by any means necessary. Now, Benjamin Rush offered Lewis a great deal of practical advice. He literally wrote a list of suggestions on how to keep the men of the Corps of Discovery healthy in the first place. Things like wear flannel next to the skin instead of wool because it would be more comfortable for the men. Wear shoes without heels, like moccasins. They're better for your feet. Cool down after heavy exertion before lying down to prevent muscle strain. Also, <laughs> Abstain, as far as possible, from the use of alcohol. That's actually rather radical advice in this era. <laughs> Rush also recommended that the men of the Corps of Discovery wash their feet in cold water every morning. Well, they couldn't really avoid that one. <laughs> but Rush also taught Meriwether Lewis the basic cures favored by doctors of the heroic school. And these boil down to bleed, blister, 
and purge. See, in Benjamin Rush's worldview, if you have a stomach ache, it's because there's something in your stomach that is overstimulating the body systems, and the problem, to get rid of the problem, you get rid of the source of stimulation. Now, we know that Meriwether Lewis purchased and stocked three medicine chests before heading upstream. Two in Philadelphia, quite possibly with Russia's advice, in 1803, and another in St. Louis in the spring of 1804. Most of the drugs in Lewis's medicine chests were purgatives, drugs designed to get things out of the body by various routes, <laughs> including a fair supply of emetics, drugs that are designed to induce vomiting. One of, the more, one of the ones that Lewis carried that a lot of folks might still have in the medicine chest today is syrup of Ipecac. Ipecac is a plant root. If you drink it, you get very violently ill a few minutes later and you empty your stomach. This is how you get rid of the problem if you have a stomach ache. Of course, if your problem happens to migrate a bit further south, uh, you move from amesis to catharsis from uh, induced vomiting to induced diarrhea. Lewis also had a wide range of laxatives, including, <coughs> rather notoriously, 50 dozen of Dr. Rush's own patented bilious pill. Benjamin Rush's personal cure for what ails you. Okay, this is a mint. But it's the right size, wrong color. Uh, <laughs> Russia's pills were 25 grains. That is five times the size of a 21st century full-dose absent tablet. And they had two active ingredients, jalap and calomel. Jalap is uh, produced from the root of a plant that grows in northern Mexico. Uh, it is an extremely powerful, fast-acting laxative. And it was used well into the 20th century. Calomel is mercurous chloride, a mercury salt. It is there to actually enhance the already rather potent effect of the gelap. Uh, <laughs> there is a gentleman over west of us, uh, name of John Fisher who has done a lot of research on the subject of Lewis's medicines and has actually reproduced a number of them, including Russia's pills. He has informed us that uh, at least one or two of his acquaintances have, for the sake of science, uh, <laughs> taken a dose of Russia's pills. The report is that they're basically x lax on steroids. <laughs> so, uh, that said, Oh, by, uh, there is, uh, uh, Stephen Ambrose aside, there is no contemporary evidence that anybody ever called these things Russia's thunderbolts or Russia's thunderclappers or whatever you hear about. Uh, Rush specifically referred to them as his opening pills. Um, the closest thing you get to that is in the British Navy, which used a very similar concoction that the men referred to as the thunderbolt cure. <laughs> Now, Benjamin Rush recommended to Lewis the use of his opening pills whenever any of his men were feeling a little bit, well, not only if they were feeling a bit constipated, but if they were just feeling generally down. Uh, one of Rush's basic unspoken concepts is, if in doubt, clean them out. <laughs> and Rush recommended dis administering as many as a half dozen of these pills to a man to get the proper effect going even if the underlying cause the man was having trouble with was dysentery. The theory is, push the course of the disease and the man will recover more quickly. Well, if you have a patient whose primary problem is a bad case of diarrhea, and you give him laxatives on top of that, <laughs> you are going to dehydrate the patient, you're going to throw his electrolytes off balance, and uh, you are going to put him at some risk of toxic shock. 
There is a minority of doctors that I'm told is growing <laughs> uh, that are holding that Sergeant Floyd's death had nothing to do with his appendix. That he just got sick with some kind of intestinal complaint and got purged to death. We can talk to that a little bit because uh, Lewis wasn't the man treating him. We'll get to that in a bit. Uh, Clark was, and Clark's knowledge of medicine pretty much was limited blistering and purging, so, uh, <clears throat> or bleeding and purging. That said, we have pinpointed at least one Lewis and Clark campsite by the presence of mercury in the latrine trench over at Lolo Pass at Traveler's Rest. Uh, it's a bit more than just saying, oh, there's mercury in the ground. <clears throat> Lewis and Clark were hardly the only people using mercury-based medicines for most of the 19th century. It's just that it's in a latrine trench that's in a spot where a latrine trench is supposed to be in a camp laid out according to the von Steuben military manual. So, purging gets rid of this stuff. Now, what happens if your problem is caused by a lack of stimulation? Well, the treatments are a bit more varied, but they are not much less extreme. Consider the uh, <coughs> situation at Fort Clatsop. The expedition members spend several months on the Pacific coast in the winter of 1806, where it is cold and wet, to the point where the men are actually having trouble with mold forming in the smokehouse, uh, the men report that in four and a half months they see the sun 12 times and that there are six days when it doesn't rain. Not surprisingly, just about everybody in the expedition came down with a cold at least once. Chest congestion from a cold is believed to be caused by a lack of stimulation. There are various means to treat it. This was one of the most popular and one that's actually come back into popular attention recently. Cupping. You take the cupping glass, heat it, usually over an alcohol lamp or a candle, until the glass is almost too hot to handle, and apply it directly to the skin of the affected part of the body. As the glass cools, the air inside forms, uh, contracts and forms a powerful suction, powerful enough to raise a blister on the skin. Anybody here ever put a suction cup on your skin? This is much bigger. <laughs> but, uh, the theory is the irritation caused to the body by blistering will stimulate the body's systems and break up the congestion. A similar effect may be had through the use of a mustard plaster. Anybody ever had one applied? If you're of a certain age, maybe. Yes, ma'am? They burn, don't they? Mm. <laughs> Or uh, the other one you might have heard out if you're of a certain age is Spanish fly. You've, anybody heard of Spanish fly before? A couple of you. This is what it's really used for. Uh, <laughs> Spanish fly is a, an insect, specifically a blister beetle. Uh, it protects itself from predators by excreting a contact poison over its skin. If you take a couple of Spanish fly beetles, even dead ones, crush them, and put the material on somebody's skin, it will blister on contact. Don't know why they thought this was an aphrodisiac. <laughs> Irritate to stimulate to cure, so is the formula. What you're doing with this is mostly giving somebody an irritation on the skin to deal with on top of the infection they already have in their lungs. <laughs> but then we come to uh, the most popular treatment of all, for Rush and almost every other doctor in the world. Consider the situation of the Lewis and Clark expedition here at, Fort, at Great Falls in the summer of 1805, carrying out this massive portage of two and a half weeks duration around all these waterfalls and rapids the Missouri River has seen foot fit to throw in their path. You have the men out hauling massive loads across the landscape getting ultimately pounded down by the sun or beaten down by heavy rain and hail. At the end of a really bad day, you may have a man staggering into camp with a pounding headache and the beginnings of maybe even a fever. You want to break that before it starts. This is how. 
Sit your patient down. Calm him. Bear the arm. Find the line of the brachial vein. And either with a scalpel or with this more specialized instrument known as a fleam, place it against the body, strike it, open a wound, let it bleed. Take at least a pint of blood out of your patient, possibly two. This may get him woozy, lightheaded. He may even lose consciousness. But when he regains his senses, his headache will be gone, and his fever will be reduced. This is venesection, bloodletting. Benjamin Rush used venesection to treat just about everything. So did most other doctors in this era. Uh, about half of those thought this was a way to stimulate the body if you didn't have enough, and the other half thought this was a way to take away stimulation if there was too much, and in general, cleanse the body of anything bad in the blood. <laughs> the problem with venesection is not that it doesn't work, but that it works just enough to make doctors think it's more useful than it really is. The fact of the matter is, bloodletting really only helps if your patient's underlying problem is due to high blood pressure. If you take blood out of the body, you will temporarily reduce blood pressure. Temporarily. It will come back up. And the more often you take blood out of the patient, the less of an effect you get. Well, it also doesn't help that in this era, doctors assume that they are working with a human body circulating 10 quarts of blood. That's twice what's actually in our system. So a doctor like Benjamin Rush, who thought nothing of removing up to five pints of blood from a patient in a single series of treatments, really isn't doing that patient any great favors afterwards. That said, we know from records of the expedition that Meriwether Lewis and William Clark regularly bled themselves, each other, and members of the expedition. Bleeding and purging are pretty much the sum total of, of William Clark's knowledge of medicine. Now, just to prove that this is not all medieval torture implements. <laughs> By weight, the most common drug Meriwether Lewis was carrying was this. 20 pounds of Peruvian bark. In 1805, malaria is not an exclusively tropical illness. It can occur anywhere that there is summer weather and standing water, which includes a fair chunk of the continental United States. Malaria, if you haven't heard of it before or experienced it, help you, <laughs> it is alternating high fever and chills. It's debilitating, it can be lethal over time. The biggest issue is to try to keep the fever from spiking so high that it kills the patient. So you're trying to find a way to control it. This does. This is uh, quinchona bark. Quinchona is a tree that grows in South America. A lot of the material here came from Peru. If you powder quinchona bark, grind it very, very fine, dissolve it in liquid, and force your patient to consume it, because it tastes pretty nasty, it will control fever. And what you have here is the natural source of the drug quinine. Quinine was, until half a century or so ago, the go-to drug for the treatment of malaria. So much so that a lot of the colonial powers were giving their people quinine water as a prophylactic to prevent them from getting malaria in the first place. That tastes really bad. Well, they carbonated it, which helped a little bit, but it was still pretty nasty. 
till somebody had the brilliant idea of putting a spot of gin in it, which is how the gin and tonic was invented, for medicinal purposes. Now, Lewis had a few other drugs that we would probably recognize a bit more today as well. Um, most notably, this. Okay, not this. If I had the real stuff, I'd probably be up on charges. Laudanum. Laudanum, besides, as I learned in my web search, uh, the name of a German thrash rock metal band, <laughs> is a tincture of opium. Ooh. A tincture. Okay. Solution is solid dissolved in water. Tincture is solid dissolved in alcohol. So opium dissolved in alcohol. <laughs> Very powerful pain reliever. Also a soporific, a sleep inducer. How do you use it? Well, generally you put a couple of drops into a tumbler of water and drink it. Just a couple. Lewis had four ounces of <coughs> laudanum in his medicine chest. That about is what fills this bottle. And he used about half of it on the course of the trip. Because, you know, laudanum has that downside. It is incredibly habit-forming. There are a few of the people who try to speculate about the causes of Lewis' death that say that might have had something to do with it. So, with this great medical arsenal at his beck and call, what, you may ask, was the most common problem Meriwether Lewis had to deal with among his people? The short answer is variants on the belly. Americans in the early 19th century suffered from a wide range of intestinal complaints, which has some to do with the American diet and a fair bit to do with the difficulties you have in preserving food properly when all you had to do it with are salt, smoke, and sugar. So you might ask, what were the members of the Corps of Discovery eating? Short answer is anything that didn't eat them first. The long answer is a little bit more complicated. The men of the Corps of Discovery were soldiers. History books often fail to mention that salient point. And the United States Army had some very specific ideas about what soldiers are supposed to eat each day. According to regulations, every soldier is supposed to receive daily one pound of bread or 12 ounces of cornmeal, split among the meals of the day. He is also supposed to receive either 12 ounces of preserved meat, which is usually salt pork, or 20 ounces of fresh meat, which is still usually a species of pork, which is supposed to be preserved, uh, prepared by boiling, because the army assumes that the foundation of the soldier's diet is soup and stew. Uh, each man is also supposed to receive a two-ounce measure of dried peas or beans each day, which are usually pooled and made into special soups a few times a week. Each man is also given an allowance of soap, candles, vinegar, we'll talk on that one in a moment, and alcohol. Four ounces a day, rum, brandy, dark wine, or most commonly in the U.S. Army, cheap whiskey. Generally serve two ounces at breakfast and two ounces at lunch. What's missing from that diet? Veggies. Vegetables. Vegetables and fruit. and fruit, right. Those things are perishable. You can't ship it very well. Soldiers are, suspected to, are expected to make up the uh, shortage by, them, by their own efforts. At any permanent fort you went to in the early 19th century, you would have a big kitchen garden next to the fort, sometimes even a small orchard, tended by the soldiers raising crops to supplement their rations. <laughs> 
Of course, Lewis and Clark can't exactly do that. <laughs> you can't put in a garden when you're hauling boats up the Missouri River. And uh, when you have a crew of strong, healthy young men burning thousands of calories a day, hauling these massive loads against the current of the mighty river, as they traipse through the middle of the world's biggest on-the-hoof meat market, these men are probably not going to be satisfied with a mere pound and a quarter of fresh meat every day. In fact, if we take the hunting records of the expedition at face value, the men of the Cora Discovery were probably consuming seven to nine pounds of meat a day. <laughs> Each. Now, a portion of that is getting boiled down to make broth because these men are literally cooking from scratch. But that's still an awful lot of meat. And you've got each man putting away the equivalent of about 30 quarter pounders to hold the bun. If you eat that much meat, certain things start to happen. For starters, uh, there is not much biological bulk in meat. <laughs> A meat diet can leave you constipated. The Russia's pills can take care of that for you but eventually you'll have other issues. Now, no doctor in the world knows what vitamins are in 1805 or will for nearly 60 more years. But doctors already are recognizing certain conditions that we know today as deficiency diseases. The things that happen when you don't get your vitamins. One of the nastiest of all human deficiency diseases is scurvy. Scurvy is what you get when you don't get your vitamin C. Scurvy begins with pain in the eyes and the joints. Lesions open on the skin. Your hair and teeth begin to fall out. As the disease progresses, the soft tissues in your body effectively begin to liquefy. So you begin to bleed internally you get really lethargic, and then you die. That's where the vinegar comes in. Doctors do not understand why, this is true for most medicine in this era, but they observe that people who take vinegar with their food don't get scurvy, at least not as often or as severely. By the way, the same is true if you eat sauerkraut or citrus juice. <laughs> uh, probably this is because most domestic vinegar in this era was being brewed out of apple cider, which has vitamin C in it. Did Meriwether Lewis and William Clark have vinegar along? Yep. Yeah. There's a record of them buying it in St. Louis. Did they have enough for the entire trip? Mm. Uh, any outfit that runs out of whiskey probably doesn't have enough vinegar. Mm. <laughs> we know that the whiskey supply, after being stretched a great deal, ran out here in Great Falls on July 4th, 1805, where the men toasted the country's independence with the last of their ardent spirits. We don't know when the vinegar might have given out. We do know that in this, era, in this frame, Meriwether Lewis was making some cryptic comments in his journals about some of his people complaining of sore eyes, joint pain, and skin lesions. Lewis put these problems down to sun dazzle and the exertions of their trip and the chafing of the leather clothing everybody was wearing by this point. He has a point. He also does not come out and say that any one man was complaining of all three symptoms, so doctors are still at a loss as to whether or not by this time around the spring and summer of 1805, some of Lewis's people weren't maybe starting to come down with scurvy. If they were, well, it helps at about this same time, those members of the Cora Discovery who were gathering food that did not involve the use of firearms, people like Sakagawa began bringing in wild fruit, 
berries and roots that were coming into season, which one assumes the men added to their diet just to get something different to eat. <laughs> and apparently they got what they needed because Lewis doesn't mention the problem again. And once they're over the mountains, there's less of an issue. Although Lewis and Clark's people were never particularly happy with the salmon and roots uh, favored by the Pacific Northwest native tribes, those foods have a lot of vitamin C in them. Now, remember also that uh, Lewis and Clark do not limit their medical attentions to the members of the Corps of Discovery. In the fall of 1805, after passing over the mountains, uh, Lewis and Clark find refuge with the Nez Perce people. One day, an old Nez Perce man approaches William Clark, complaining of a pain in his hip and asking Clark if he can do something about it. Clark takes pity on the older fellow. By the way, older could mean he was like 48, because, you know, Lewis and Clark aren't all that old. Uh, and, but instead of breaking out his bleeding kit, as he would for the men, Lewis, or Clark gives the man some ointment. Now, there are a dozen or more different ointments in Lewis's pharmacopoeia, including this rather pungent mixture of pine pitch and uh, beeswax. <laughs> we do not know which ointment Clark gave the old man. But apparently he rubbed it in and it worked. The pain went away. So deservedly or not, William Clark had a reputation with the Nez Perce of being a great healer. And Lewis used that to advantage the following spring. The other salient fact many history books don't mention very well is just how dependent Lewis and Clark were on the people they met along the way. From the native people, Lewis and Clark received food, clothing, shelter, horses, companionship, guides, information, lots of things. And they got most of these things through trade, whether they called it that or not. When the expedition set out in the spring of 1804, they were carrying over 12 tons of presents and trade goods to hand out as they went. Of course, by the time the expedition left Fort Clatsop, that stock was down to a pile to fit in a pair of handkerchiefs. And the men were literally cutting buttons off their dress uniform coats to have something to trade with. Well, in the spring of 1806, Lewis and Clark got back to the Nez Perce people, and for the one time on this entire trip, were actually forced to turn back from their first attempt to cross the Rockies, by heavy snow up in the mountains. So they wound up spending almost six weeks among the Nez Perce at a place where the good fishing spots were 60 miles away and food supplies are dwindling. Lewis hit on the idea of trading medical care for food. With Clark as his front man, Lewis set up his own little clinic and took in Nez Perce patients, giving them, one assumes, a fair number of ointments that he could make from local ingredients but also, by his own admission, a good deal of eye water. Apparently, one of the most common complaints the Nez Perce had that spring was sore eyes, which isn't terribly surprising if you just spent the winter in a smoke-filled hut. So Lewis took water, and into it he dissolved two chemicals, white vitriol and sugar of lead and then administered this as drops. So one little bottle treats a lot of patients. Now, white vitriol is zinc sulfate. Anybody here use Visine? Hmm? Really? <laughs> I thought everyone did. It still uses zinc sulfate as an active ingredient. Sugar of lead, not so much. <clears throat> That's lead acetate. Now, uh, one thing that has been unfortunate for humans down through history is the recognition that sweet things, if they have an organic source, are almost never poisonous. Mm. 
one of the reasons why we like Swedes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, animal or vegetable that tastes sweet, good. Mineral, <laughs> not so much. Lead acetate gets its common name, sugar of lead, because it does taste sweet on the tongue. But like pretty much any other lead-bearing compound, it is toxic. And if you keep using it, it will build up in your tissues over time and start causing you trouble. I will point out, however, that Meriwether Lewis used his eye water to treat his own people as well as the Nez Perce. The problem with the eye water was not the toxicity of the lead acetate so much as the fact that Meriwether Lewis was only treating a symptom. There are some truly serious medical conditions that might be causing that eye pain rather than just strain from being in a smoke-filled room. Scurvy, I mentioned already. Brain tumors and a few other things, same idea. If all you're treating is the eye pain, you might be missing an underlying problem. And Meriwether Lewis instinctively understood that. In fact, he wrote in the journals, uh, I wish we could do more to help these poor wretches in their distress. But, there's always a but, we do them no great hurt and our need for supply is grave. Meriwether Lewis knowingly turned the core of discovery into Dr. Clark's traveling medicine show to get his people back over the Rocky Mountains and into a place where they could get their food by shooting it. Now we can still get back to what most people start their talk on 19th century medicine with, the blood, guts, and gore. We know that Meriwether Lewis carried a full surgical kit with him. And indeed, surgery in this era was pretty nasty by modern standards. No anesthesia, no antisepsis. But at the same time, because of those things, uh, with weaponry that can cause really, really nasty wounds, Sometimes the only way to save a badly wounded person is to cut away the damaged piece and save the rest of the body. That said, we know that Meriwether Lewis only ever used his surgical gear once, and that was not on a member of the Corps of Discovery. During the winter of 1805, the expedition were in North Dakota at Fort Mandan. And one day, the Mandan brought in a young boy, they didn't specify his age, probably an early teenager, who had been out and had gotten caught out with only a buffalo robe to protect him on a night when the temperatures were getting down to around 30 or 40 below zero. Mm. The boy's toes had become frostbitten and had then become gangrenous. Yeah. Lewis had to amputate the boy's toes to save him from death by blood poisoning. In fact, Lewis said, he didn't really have to use his knife. They said the boy's toes were so badly deteriorated he could literally have twisted them off with his fingers. Okay. If there's one bit of surgery we think Lewis might have done it more often, I have a question for you. What is the one medical specialty that uses the phrase surgery in its title. Dentistry. Yes, Doctor of Dental Surgery. Dentistry was no more advanced than medicine in the early 19th century, but Americans and people around the world had issues with their teeth. And by the way, a diseased tooth can cause you just about as much trouble as anything else if it gets worse. <laughs> the problem is, the only way you can really get rid of a diseased tooth in this era is to get rid of it, amputate it, basically. And that's what this is for. This implement is known as a tooth key. tooth key. What you do is you line this up to the diseased tooth with that little hook here, turn it to get a nice tight grip on the tooth, and pull with a twisting motion. That'll get the tooth out. Of course, it will probably also break it off. You can't leave those bits in the mouth. So then you also need the growth foot elevator. 
to go back in with those little hooks and dig out the individual pieces. Now, to prevent tooth decay in this era, you do have toothbrushes. They are generally made with a, hand, a bone handle and hog bristles for the brush. And you even have a dental powder. It's usually made of finely powdered salt and charcoal. charcoal. Don't want to use that? We can take care of you when the tooth goes bad. Compared to their 21st century counterparts, the medical tools and techniques favored by Lewis and Clark hardly warrant mention. You can make a case that if the men of the Corps of Discovery were so healthy, it was in spite of what Lewis and Clark did for them. On the other hand, Lewis and Clark used these tools and techniques because this is the height of medical knowledge in 1805. They truly believe this is how you keep your people healthy and able to complete their mission. And say what you will about how any of these things worked, or how well the fact remains. In a journey of two and a half years, covering over 8,000 miles mm -hmm through wilderness terrain, 50 or so different people took part in some aspect of the Lewis and Clark expedition, and only one man died. Is there anything more that you'd like to hear something about this evening? We say it that way so it doesn't sound like I'm giving you a test by saying, any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Sir? I'm curious about parasites. They must have been absolutely loaded with parasites. Yeah, <coughs> it's kind of a given in this period. Um, fleas, in particular, uh, fleas couldn't be a uh, tapeworm. Down south, ringworm. Uh, yeah. It, those kind of internal parasites and external on that matter, scabies, lice, uh, yeah. You, you, there's not much you can do about the, I mean, the, about all you can do about body lice is, you know, take a bath, scrub real hard, maybe douse it with some colonial whiskey and uh, hope for the best. If your clothing is bad enough, you're going to have to just burn it and start fresh. Did they make any mention of the STDs? Oh, yes, that one. I guess I usually leave that out of my general audience things because we have, you know, children, but everyone here is an adult. Yes, that is an issue. Uh, <laughs> one of those other little points histories often don't always mention about Lewis and Clark is that the native peoples they met along the way were in a habit quite often of offering female companionship as a means of hospitality. Now, the captains, uh, it is said, tried to set an example for the men by being celibate. How uh, well they kept that is a matter of debate. <laughs> um, but they allowed the men to indulge and thought of it as a way of keeping the men's morale up. And yes, that leads to the point. Lewis notes he does not meet any tribe that doesn't show traces of syphilis or gonorrhea. And if you start you know, interacting with that, you wind up with it yourself. The most common treatment for syphilis in this period, syphilis is the really big problem, uh, is a mercury compound, again, that is injected, not through the skin. Uh, <laughs> there is an implement here that is one of those truly cringe-inducing things to describe. It is referred to as the penis syringe. Ooh. This is a metal syringe about yay big, and it has on it a uh, needle if you want to call that, about this long, Ooh. slightly curved with a bulbous head, not sharp, bulbous, because this is inserted up the urethra to the base of the manhood where the drug is delivered. Okay, cringe all you like. The fact is mercury-bearing compounds like that were the treatment for venereal disease until the advent of antibiotics in the 1940s. Wow. <laughs>
air. It is noted that part of the reason for a lot of the, when uh, in 1806, Lewis and Clark split the expedition from Traveler's Rest. Clark took most of the men back along the way they'd gone the previous year through the Bitterroot Valley, and then went over across uh, to the Yellowstone Basin, while Lewis tried out the path that the Nez Perce had mentioned to them, the uh, road to Buffalo, Lewis and Clark Pass. We believe most of the men riding with Lewis were with him because he was in the process of treating them for STDs. Mm. <clears throat> and that's another thread in the Lewis conspiracy theorists about his death that say he might have been suffering from something. So, anything else? Yes. One of the tools that I saw from up there was right beside the cell. What was that going for? Was this, this? A curved one. Oh, yeah. this one. Well, that's a bestuary knife. Uh, if you're doing an amputation, you use the base, the capital knife to go through the skin. Right. The bestuary mm -hmm. knife goes through the flesh and sinew, and the saw goes through the bone. Okay. Generally, you would isolate the wounded area with a tourniquet above the wound site, take everything off, a good surgeon holding his people down can get that limb off in less than a minute. You want to work fast, there's no anesthetic. Shock can kill a man almost as fast as the wound does. Um, the closest you have in this, there is the, in, the, uh, in the museum collection at Fort Ticonderoga historic site in upstate New York, there was a terrible battle there during the French and Indian War where the, the British lost hundreds and hundreds of men trying to assault the fort. One of the men who was in that fight was the colonel of the 42nd Highland Infantry, the Black Watch. They went in with 1,100 men and they came out with about 250. Hmm. Uh, the colonel was badly wounded in the leg. Hmm. They didn't have the right equipment. They gave him a muscle <coughs> ball to bite on so that he wouldn't basically bite off his own tongue. It's in the collection. It's bitten almost in half with the force of the man biting down on it. In fact, the most common thing you would actually have in a medical kit is what they call a bite block. It's a wooden piece you, uh, covered in leather that you would put between the man's teeth so he could clench down on it. Uh, you could give the man alcohol or laudanum, but that's risky because with the shock it might actually stop his breathing. But generally speaking, what you wanted to do during an operation was work as fast as you could Oh, and the other piece I forgot to put out, the cauterizing iron. Cauterize off the, uh, you know, see, heat sear off those pieces. Cover it as fast as you could and hope that the man survived the infection that came afterwards. Because there was always an infection afterwards. I've read an 1826 medical manual. It assumes the wound will superate. It just goes between the distance of what they call laudable pus and putrefaction. Laudable pus, we are told, is thick and creamy and doesn't have a bad odor. Putrefaction is thin and watery and stinks. But you assume you'll have, you will always have that after an infection. Mm -hmm. The average soldier on the battlefield in the Napoleonic era, this time frame of Lewis and Clark, went into action with a 95% chance of coming out alive. If he was wounded, that number dropped to 50%. If he got to the point of having had medical attention, that dropped to about 30%. Mm -hmm. If the wound didn't kill you, the infection afterwards did. Yes, ma'am. What was the average ages of the men? And I know Sacagawea. Lewis recruited up. relatively young. Most of the men in the Corps were in their early 20s, early to mid-20s. Mm -hmm. uh, when the expedition started, Lewis was 29, Clark mm -hmm. was 33. Um, the oldest man on the expedition, other than Toussaint Charbonneau, was Patrick Gass. And Gass was the last survivor. Uh -huh. uh, he lived to be almost 100 years old. He died in 1870. So. So these men were relatively young, mm -hmm. and Lewis and Clark also recruited men who had no family, oh. because they didn't know how many would come back. Yes? There must have been some accident 
of the men when they were chopping wood or something. Oh, yeah. You, you hear several things. Private Bratton wrenched his back, which Lou was treated with hot stones, you know, basically a sweat lodge. Uh, you had a couple of men who had dislocated fingers or scabs or sores, uh, especially riding horses bareback. Um, there are times when Lewis and Clark both are sick and mention it in the journals. Uh, but nobody gets, other than Floyd, gets so sick that they wind up being in danger of their life. Other, well, uh, York and, uh, they say two of them actually. Floyd <coughs> died in Sakagawea, who did not, at least not in 1805. Sakagawea's illness we're not so sure of. Most doctors think it was a pelvic obstruction, probably the aftermath of the birth of her son. Uh, it's also probably the situation that killed her in 1812. So. Anything else? All right. Well, everybody, thank you for coming out tonight, braving the cold and the wind.